Hood Scholarship. So this week, after going over some comments on the channel's comment section, I noticed an overwhelming demand for sources and references. Well, what if I told you that's exactly what we're on today? Oftentimes, in this age of information, we rely on the studies of others with hope and belief that their scholarship is genuine, mainly relying on social media to obtain our knowledge. But over here, we preach a different gospel. Read the text for yourself. The main problem with that is most of us don't even know where to look. So today, I'm going to share some of my sources and references in this special edition of What If I Told You My Sources, the Mesopotamian edition. Now often, we'll hear the term Mesopotamia, which derives from the Greek mesos, meaning middle, and potamos, which means river, literally translating to a country between two rivers. But this country between two rivers was never referred to as Mesopotamia by the inhabitants, for there were several different cultures that rose to prominence in this land, each one borrowing from the other. Although early scholars of the studies referred to all cuneiform script as Babylonian, the last 50 years would bring an enlightenment that would later pull out four separate empires in an approximate 6,000 year time span. The Greek coin term Mesopotamia, which is in modern day Iraq, is split up into two regions, the north and the south. The earliest group to inhabit the area would be the Sumerians, or the Sagiga, known as the black-headed ones or the black slaves. The Sumerians, who spoke an isolated language from any ancient language known today, were eventually conquered by the Akkadians, who spoke a Semitic language and adopted the Sumerian cuneiform script. Both languages were used throughout the history of the area until the Iron Age, when the Aramaic language would become dominant. The people in the north would later become the Assyrians after one of their main cities, Assur, and with the emergence of the city of Babylon in the south, the southerners became known as the Babylonians. So you had the empires of Sumer, Akkad, Assur, and Babylon, who all staked claims to land in the area and who all left their mark on the land, but no bigger mark than the estimated half a million to two million cuneiform tablets discovered. Yet and still, less than 10% has been read or translated. Found on these cuneiform tablets are wedge-shaped impressions that bear copies of records of daily life, musical and legal matters, astronomy and literature, as well as religious texts. So today, I'm going to present some sources that will shed a little light on some of these texts that have been deciphered and where exactly we can find them at. The first source I'll present is Ancient Text for the Study of the Hebrew Bible, a Guide to the Background Literature by Kenton L. Sparks, published in 2005. I refer to this as the Source of Sources for references on the subject of Near Eastern Texts. The second source is James Pritchard's Ancient Near Eastern Texts Relating to the Old Testament, which is a collection of ancient texts divided into 10 sections, and that was the go-to source for half a century until the emergence of my next source. Known as COS, or Context of Scripture, we have a four-volume set, three of which I have here. Context of Scripture brought to the public many ancient texts that have until recently only been seen by a small community of linguists. The next source I'll be presenting is Myths from Mesopotamia, Creation, the Flood, Gilgamesh, and Others by Stephanie Daly which is a collection of Mesopotamian tablets translated by Daly, allowing us to do comparative studies with other translations. And the last source I'll provide should look familiar from the last episode. It's George Barton's Miscellaneous Babylonian Inscriptions, published in 1918, where Barton provides not just the translation, but the transliteration, as well as the autographed copy of the tablets in which are translated in his book. So now, I'll reference Kenton Sparks' ancient text for the study of the Hebrew Bible and give you an example of how this text is used. So as we scroll through the table of contents, we can see the various cultures and ancient texts from the area. Being that we're currently in the Mesopotamian Eden series, we'll go to section 10, the myths, and look at section 1.1 for Sumerian myths, which as you can see, can be found starting on page 307. And as we get into the myth section, we come across the story of the Eridu Genesis. 
Kenton Sparks not only gives a brief history on the tablet which was found, but at the end of each tablet, he shows where you can find the text and translations. And as you can see, we can find this text in COS, or Context of Scripture, 1.158, pages 513 through 515. And at looking at the text, we see we have a translation for the Eridu Genesis from Thorkild Jakobsen, accompanied with notes. However, the two most important references are actually free and easily accessible, right off the touch of your phone. CDLI, standing for Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative, and ETCSL, which is an acronym for the Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Literature. Both of these sites, you can find any available translation for the ancient clay tablets, but you can also find pictures of the actual tablets themselves from all views, as well as any other information related to the topic. So I figured I'd share some sources to make it easier to follow along with each episode, as I won't just tell you what the text says, but I'll encourage you to read it for yourself. So be sure to stay tuned as next week we go back into the Eden series and Adam, or man, trespassing into the garden, as well as part two of What If I Told You My Sources, Hebrew edition. Good gosh.